My people know not the judgment of the Lord. Go to Jeremiah, please, the 8th chapter. 8th chapter of Jeremiah. I want you to read with me just one verse and then leave Jeremiah 8th chapter open on your lap because that's where we're going to be the rest of the message. The 7th verse, chapter 8, Jeremiah. The stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. What an indictment. Let's pray. Lord, you are doing something very deep in this church. You're doing something very profound and wonderful. You're digging deep into our hearts. And in 1997, Lord, you're going to purge us as we've never been purged. You're going to search us like we've never been searched. You're going to bring forth revelation and truth that sets us free. And Lord, out of that is going to come a rejoicing such as never been heard before in this house. Times Square Church is going to be jumping with the praises of God. Oh, Lord, you're going to do something marvelous in our midst because you've begun it in our hearts. You've begun it here. You've begun it in all of our hearts. Those of us who deliver the word of the Lord, you've done a work, oh, God, this past year and now you're preparing us. I share what Pastor Carter said, a great anticipation of what you're going to do. But, Lord, first you have to cut. The surgeon comes in and he cuts so there can be healing. Lord, you may have to cut even deeper this afternoon as you did this morning. But, Lord, we thank you for the surgeon's knife. We thank you, Lord, that you're willing. What a, what a marvelous act of grace to deal with us as you do firmly, lovingly, but, oh, God, without compromise. Lord Jesus, I want to hear when I come to this church, I want to hear an uncompromising message. I want that which would would expose anything hidden in my life. I want the mirror held in front of my face. Oh, Spirit of God, come down now. I take your authority, Father, over every principality and power of darkness. Nothing, nothing, nothing shall hinder the word of the Lord. Lord, sanctify our ears. Sanctify my voice and let every ear hear the word of the living God. We glorify you. And we chase every demon out of this house. Every devil out of hell must go in Jesus' name. That the word of the Lord have free course. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. In the first eight chapters of Jeremiah, the Lord uh, poses some incredible questions, powerful questions. And he's listing, God is listing his concerns for his own people. He's not talking about the heathen. He's not talking about the enemies of Israel. He's talking about God's own chosen people. And, and some of the questions God asked of Jeremiah, like this, he said, why is there such a tendency to backsliding among my people? He says, why do they cling so stubbornly to their secret sins? Why do they continue in their deception? And why do they have a tendency to go back to their old sins? And then he goes on in the first eight chapters, why are my people not really repenting of their sins? Because there was a false repentance. He said, why do they not blush when they sin so openly? He said, my people don't know how to blush anymore. He said, why don't they even say, what have we done? He said, they sin and they don't even ask the question, what have we done? There's no regret. They sin without remorse. They sin without guilt. Why are my people not letting go of their sins? Why are they not wanting full deliverance from the bondage of the sin? He said, why aren't they coming to me for freedom? Why are they not blessing for their sins? Now, folks, he's talking about, God is talking about his own dear, beloved children. He's not talking about heathen. Now, think about that as we go on in the message today. You'll find these God-spoken questions, especially in the 8th chapter of Jeremiah. Because you see, in Jeremiah's time, the people were coming to the Lord weeping. They came searching the Scriptures. They, they, they were probing into the Word of God. But even though they studied the law and claimed they wanted to walk by the law, 
They refused to forsake their idolatry. They wanted their idols. They wanted the sins of their flesh. And they wanted to serve God at the same time. It was a mixture of worship of idols and a worship of Jehovah. And that sickened the heart of God. God says in the, look at verse 5, chapter 8, verse 5. Why then is this people of Jerusalem? You know, Jerusalem is his own beloved city. And these are his own beloved people. When then is this people of Jerusalem, why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by perpetual backsliding? They hold fast the seat. They refuse to return. He says, why are they holding on to their sins? Folks, look at me, please. This is the question I believe God is asking this church and every church in these last days. If we really believe Jesus is coming, then we stop playing games. If we believe that Jesus is coming and he's right at the door and we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, then we go into this word and we tremble at what we read and we do everything within our God-given powers and under the conviction, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to deal with our lives. And again, I hear the Holy Spirit saying in our day to me, to you, to all of us, why do you still hold on to the deceit that's in your heart? Why don't you return to me and why don't you let it go? Why aren't you coming to, for full deliverance? Why this double standard, this mixture in your heart that you would come and serve me and worship me and praise me and love me and go into my word, inquiring of my word, and then at the same time holding fast to the deceit that is in your own heart? He said, why are my people holding fast? They won't let go of the deceit that is in their heart. It's amazing because God said, I said, holy prophets. He, he said, it's not because you haven't heard the word. They rose up early. I sent them early in the morning to late at night. They walked the streets. They, they wooed you by the spirit. They warned you by the spirit. And yet, in spite of all of that, you hold on to your deceit. Folks, if you have deceit in your heart of this church, it's not because, if you've been sitting in this church hearing the gospel preached from this pulpit, it's not because you haven't been warned. It isn't because you haven't heard the truth. But he says, why do you still hold on to that thing? Why do you still hold on to that one thing that I've been dealing with? Why won't you let it go? In this case, it was blatant idolatry. The people rejected the call of the prophets. They hardened their hearts. They clamored for a message that was soothing. They said, preach us easy words, soothing words. Oh, beloved, I can name you churches in this city right now while I'm standing here. Now, maybe not at this particular hour, but every Sunday morning you can go to some of the famous churches in this city and you will not hear one single word that would upset you. It will not raise a hair on your head. It will not raise a conviction in your soul. It will soothe you. You could live in any kind of sin and go in there and feel good about it and walk out feeling even better. Because the man who stands in the pulpit, I tell you right now, is a false prophet. If he will not preach against sin, if he will not show people their iniquities, if he will not deal with the deceit of the heart, he's a false prophet. He has nothing to say. And the only people who go to those kind of churches are those who don't want their sins dealt with. And if they go to a church where the gospel is truly being preached, they walk out and say, that's legalism. And they get angry. Beloved, I see a spirit that's in the church today. The condition described in Jeremiah 8 is a condition today. God's people saved, baptized with the Holy Ghost, still holding fast to deceit, under great delusion, hoping to serve the Lord and still serve their secret sins. Let me make this very personal. We're not talking now about the children of Israel in Jerusalem in Jeremiah's time. We're not talking about those of the Old Testament, not even the New Testament. We're talking about 1996, the last Sunday of 1996. We're talking Times Square Church, David Wilkerson, and this congregation, and all who hear me. Are you sitting here in the presence of God now? The Holy Spirit was moving here mightily in a beautiful way. He came down now just to, to honor 
Christ, Holy Spirit, is always here to honor Jesus. And he's honored Jesus in our midst, and the glory of the Lord was here. Did you sit through all of this? Did you praise the Lord? Did you have your hands up? Did you worship Him today with sin clinging to your heart? Something He dealt with time and time again and you still will not lay it down? You still cling? You still hold fast to the deceit that God by His Spirit is dealing with? That's what God is asking Jeremiah. How can my people come in my presence and worship me and seek my word and still hold fast to their deceit? How can it be that so many Christians today can worship the Lord and, and continue, I mean, month after month and even year after year and not deal? Through their sin. In Jeremiah 8, 5, he says, Why do my people fast the deceit? Why do they not repent and return to holiness? Why did they... In fact, the description is given by God to the prophet Jeremiah. Why do they race off after their sins like horses going to battle? Those horses would, would go against those stays and absolutely puncture themselves. They were rushing into the battle, the sound of battle. There was something in their blood rushing into their sin, rushing into the battle. And folks, he said, that's what my people are doing. They're like wild horses running into the battle, holding fast to the sea, running to destruction, destroying themselves. In verse 7, God answers his own question. And he said, why do, why do my people hold fast to the deceit? And he answers it. It is because my people know not my judgments. And God is saying, I warned them that I would judge their sins. I would pour up my wrath upon those who refuse to forsake their wicked ways. I sent a message after message. I have been patient. We have, we have Christians who believe God can't, there's no end to God's patience. Folks, you, you would know your Bible if you believed that. You would not know your Bible. There comes a time when God says, you have hardened your heart. Nothing I say, nothing I do, nothing I could do, even as God of the universe, will change you. And God talks of giving people over to their sin to reprobate minds. Folks, we are going to have to deal with the reality of the Scripture in these last days. The truth alone that can set us free. Somebody can come to you and talk to you about your sin, but until you allow the Holy Ghost to take this word and cause you to tremble at it, you will never be delivered from your sin. Especially now, if you have cozied up to it, become your bosom sin, and you're comfortable with it now. God had warned severe judgment upon those who flaunted his mercy, and he said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn. That was the end of his patience. He said, I will overturn. I, I will deal with this. This people were, uh, judgment was already coming because uh, the Assyrian army had already approached to the, the north border, border in Dan. And they, they said, we can hear the neighing of their horses. These are the Israelites talking who had idolatry in their heart and the stumbling blocks of iniquity in them. And they, they, they were running, fleeing to their cities for the walled cities. And what they were saying, we will run to the cities and we will sit in silence and wait to see what God will do. And what they're saying, we'll go into these walled cities and we will sit and ride out the judgment. God had warned them by the prophets. He said, your sin will find you out. He said, there's judgment on sin. I've been patient. I've wooed you. You're my children. I'm your father. I love you. But you will not heed. You will not listen. He said, there comes a time I have to deal, I have to judge. And God was judging, the Assyrian armies were coming, those prancing horses, they were killing wives and babies and children, everything in sight was being wiped out, and the word came all through Judah and Israel, and they were fleeing to the cities, and they were saying, let us enter into the defense cities and let us sit silent. God has given us water of gall to drink, because we've sinned against the Lord. And folks, they didn't know the judgment of God. They didn't have the slightest idea what was coming. Their concept was we will run into these walled cities and 
There will be a time of trouble. There may not be enough food to eat. There may be a time of no drink. We may be a little thirsty. We may have a time of trial, but we will ride out the storm. And there are people now, I mentioned speaking to a pastor who was involved in outright slander and gossip. And I approached him about it. And I said, do you know your Bible? Do you not understand that God can cut you off? That all through the book of Proverbs, he said, I will chew you to pieces. I will deal with you. I said, do you understand that the judgment of God is on slander, whether you're a preacher or anybody else? And he turned and waved it off and he said, all right, then I face the judgment of God. And I, I, I walked away thinking, oh, if you knew what, if you only knew the judgment of God, you couldn't say that. You couldn't say that. He didn't know anything about the judgment of God. He had no concept of the judgment of God. You can't sit silent and ride out the judgments of God upon your sin. You can't say, all right, and this is what they were saying. We have sinned against God. We have failed God. We, we have been disobedient. We've held to our secret sins. And now we're going to face a time of judgment. But we'll come out of it on the other side. They're going to hold their sins right through the judgment. And how wrong they were. Because they didn't survive the judgments of God. And there are people, Christians, who honestly believe, you know, God's merciful. He, he will... I, 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 they have no plans to lay down their sin. They have no plan to yield to the Holy Spirit. And you know, folks, all that God is asking of you is that you surrender. That's all it is. Just surrender. He's there with open arms. He's there with power. Everything you need. He's there to help you hate your sin. He's there as a loving Father, just hovering over you, waiting for your heart to reach out to Him. Just wanting you to cry, I hate my sin, Father. Come and deliver me from my sin. And He reaches down and pulls you out. But when you become stubborn, you become hardened in your sin, you become blinded to the evil of your sin, you no longer see the deceitfulness of sin. And so you, you say, all right, so I've... So judgment. What is he going to do? Is he going to, you know, all right, I might lose my job. What, what, how bad can it be? Folks, I wouldn't want to wait around for an answer to that. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I, I was thinking of a Christian man that I counseled with about a troubled marriage and he's another one of those who had left his wife because he said she's like a witch she's mean she's arrogant and I warned him that God hated divorce because I knew that's where he's headed and I said you're going to lose the blessing in favor of God I said, you're going to have God turn against you because he hates it. And, and you're, you're blatantly walking against his law. And you know what he said? I guess I'll just have to face the consequences of my action. I guess I'll just have to face the consequences. Face the consequences of the judgment of God? That man didn't know the judgments of God. My people don't know the judgment of the Lord. Like Israel, God had given his people... Many warnings about the judgment against sin in believers. Many, many warnings, but they turned those warnings aside. You know, in Romans, the second chapter, we have a very, very clear warning from God. He said, if you do the same things that you condemn in others, if you sin just like those that you condemn, your judgment is sure. He said, you that preach, you shouldn't steal. Do you steal? He said, you, you that condemn adultery in others, are you committing adultery? Do you sit here this afternoon in the middle of an affair, a secret affair nobody knows anything about but God and you? But sir, I'm going to tell you something else. You think your wife doesn't know, she knows and she'll find out. 
Because God said, be sure. What? His sin will, what? Who said that? So count your moments. Take your pleasure now because it's all going to be exposed, the Bible says. Be sure your sin will find you out. Now that's God's word. And that's a word of mercy. God puts these signs up, these warning signs. Because you see, right down that road, there's a precipice and it goes right over a brink. And God has all these signs saying, stop, danger, danger. Be sure your sin will find that's a dangerous sign. So God is trying to stop you from going over the brink. It's all mercy. How many believe that? And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth them which do such things, and you do the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? Would you go to Romans 2? Let's look at it. Romans 2. Still with me? Did I hear somebody say, Brother Wilson, you're getting hard. No, no, no. I'm preaching mercy to you. Romans 2. Would you go to verse 21? Well, let's start at verse 19. You're confident that thou, that thou thyself are died of the blind, a light to them which are in darkness, instruct of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hast the form of knowledge and the truth of the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that saith a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is, it is written. Look at me, please. He, he's speaking to Christians. He said, you're blaspheming the name of Jesus when you practice something you're preaching against. When you tell others... And folks, some of us, we allow things in our lives that we wouldn't excuse in anybody else's life. We, we allow things in life that we would condemn in others. And the Lord said, that's blasphemy among the unsaved. That is something God says, I will not endure. He said, you treasure up wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Paul said, there is no respect of persons with God. For the Lord shall judge the secrets of men heart, men's hearts by Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you something. I'm 65 now, going on 66. And I've been preaching for many, many years since just a boy. And I've looked back over my life, and I thank God for the grace, His keeping power, how He's kept me by His grace. Many times he could have cast me aside and destroyed me. But the grace of God came. But let me tell you, I said, oh God, how is it? How is it that you have kept me these years? And there's one verse, there is absolutely one verse that has been one of my key verses all my life, all my ministry. And it's this. I just want you to listen to it. It's Proverbs 16:6. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. By the fear of the Lord. Folks, the church of Jesus Christ has lost the fear of God. We've made God to appear like a man like ourselves, just like us. And we judge our sins as though God were somebody just like us that would appease us. That if we would cry and say, I'm so sorry, we'd go sin again, cry and repent, sin again, cry and repent, sin again. You say, after all, he said, we're to forgive 70 times 7. Well, I, I, I've got this habit, I've got this secret sin in my life, and I, I, I may have confessed it maybe 200 times, but I've got 200 sometimes more to go. It's not what that scripture means whatsoever. God said, I am no respecter of persons. 
And here's the point, and listen closely. There are many people who hold on to their secret sins because they feel that they're special. They feel that somehow because uh, they, they, they don't hurt anybody, I've often, I've often wondered, I, I was at a church once where there was a janitor that was not a Christian and he would sit, he probably sat for 20 years hearing the gospel, hearing all the speakers and everything and never moved by God. And I thought, how do, how does a man like that hear preaching after preaching and nothing moves him? And he, and he sits back in the back of the church and just sits there unmoved. He's a janitor, he takes care of the church, and he's there watching, he's hearing, and, and after a while goes in one ear and out the other, doesn't mean anything, it's just words to him anymore. You know, because that man actually was thinking to himself, like so many, really, those drug addicts that come to this church, I'm not like them. These alcoholics and all these people get up and say that they're saved and say, I'm not that, I'm a pretty good person. And, and I, I feel in my heart that when I get before God, I'll be okay. The Lord's not going to judge me. And you see, they know nothing of the judgment of God. They know nothing that they must stand before the judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die and after that to judgment. And that is final, that is sure. But we have people that, that have absolutely, almost the whole city out here. You can take people that have not murdered anybody, people that faithfully pay their income tax. Oh, they've got their little secret things, yes. But because there's no big, blatant sin, I'm okay. And that's why they write books like, I'm okay, you're okay. <laughs> but I believe what Apostle Peter said, for the time has come that judgment must begin in the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall it be? of them that obey not the gospel of God. Now, folks, this judgment of God, let me talk to you about it for just a moment. We know so little about the fear of God today. We know so little about the judgment of God. The Bible says it's by the fear of God that we, we run from evil, that we flee from evil, from our idols. The fear of God, and you can't incubate that. You can't invent it. You can't just make it arise in your heart. That comes through sincere crying and praying out to God. The Holy Ghost has to fire that flame in you. My prayer every day is, oh God, I want your fear to blaze in me. When I stand in the pulpit, I want to, I want the fear of God blazing in me. When I go through, get up in the morning, let the fear of God be a blaze in my heart. That when the enemy comes at me with temptation and all these other things, the fear of God will be burning bright and be consumed in that fire and that blaze. Hallelujah. How many want the fear of God? The holy, righteous fear of God. You could never sin lightly. But you see, the, the judgments prophesied against God's people in Jerusalem were not eternal judgment. This was not judgments that would come to them when they die. These were judgments that come to us while they're here on earth. And these are the judgments of God. Folks, it's not just judgment on judgment day. Sin that was not confessed and forsaken, sin that is not laid down, those secret things that cling to us and grow and take root and get harder and deeper into our spirits, that's what God is after. And you know, sometimes people will ask God to pluck up one sin and one idol is knocked down and another is raised up right in its place. And God wants to take out all idolatry. He wants to take away all stumbling blocks. Hallelujah. Not knocking one down and let another coming up in its place. But you see, these judgments of God that God's people don't know anything about, he begins to explain those judgments. I'm going to give you just two evidences of those judgments, two consequences of those judgments listed in this eighth chapter. First of all, verse 10. Would you look at verse 10, please? Therefore will I give... No, first of all, it says, My people know not the judgment of the Lord. Look at verse 10. Therefore will I give their wives unto others. I will give their wives unto others. Now look at me, please. This is the judgment of, of sin, especially in the, the life of a married person. If you're married, listen to me closely. 
God says, I'll give your wives to others. This is blatant divorce. This is pandemic divorce. This is the breaking up of homes. This is the dysfunctional family, and we see it everywhere we go. Folks, the judgment of God is on America, and it's happening in the church. Did, did you get the latest news? I saw this in a, in a Christian magazine, that there are as many evangelical Christians divorcing as those that are not going to church. Just as much divorce in evangelical churches as in the world. Dysfunctional families. This is the judgment of God. He said, if you hold on to your sin, you're married and you have sin, you have lust in your heart, and you will not lay it down and you follow your idolatry, it's going to cost you your home. It's going to cost you your family. It's going to cost your children. I have seen grandparents whose children have been raised, and those two never did settle things with God. They never did have it right with God. And then when the children were gone, the children were the only thing holding it together when the children are married. God, grandma, grandpa get divorced. And you know what I've seen? Especially with ministers, grandparent ministers of the gospel. You know what I've seen over and over again? I've seen that divorce spread all through their married kids. One after another, following the example of their parents. And he said, I'll give your wives to another. The judgment of God is a dysfunctional family, a loss of children. In Malachi chapter 2, God said, You cover the altar of the Lord with your tears and with weeping and with crying out, yet you are untrue to your wives. Yet she's your companion, the wife of your covenant. You've wearied the Lord with your words. You think God still delights in them that do evil. You think God still delights in you, even though he sees what is in your heart. I, w I wonder how many wives there are listening to me now. Folks, I'm at the place now. I've told God I have to make every year count. I have to make every message count, every day count. And I, I have been faithful as I know how to be. I've, I've made mistakes, yes, I know. In, 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 in the past years, I've made mistakes. I'm not a perfect man. I want to talk to you plain and simple. It may sound blunt to you. But how many wives are sitting here right now wanting out of their marriage? How many husbands are wanting out? You're thinking of divorce. You're thinking of splitting. You're thinking of going your own way. He's, God said, you come to my house and you cover the altar with tears. And yet you're unfaithful in your heart. He's talking about what's going on in the heart. You're unfaithful in your heart. You're treachery, you have treachery in your heart. God says, I'll judge that. I will judge that. God, let it not be in this church. Let it be that every wife that's here thinking she's in an impossible situation believe that nothing is impossible with God. Let every husband that's hearing me right now not even anticipate or think about it because God hates divorce. That is not an option for a believer. It's not an option. It can't even enter your thoughts. It will cost you your home, it will cost you your children, it will cost you everything. And that's the second judgment. Verse 10, and I'll give your fields to them that shall inherit them. In the original Hebrew it says, I'll give your fields to others. Your field is, your, is the area, that, that, that whole substance of what you spent your whole life building. For me, my field is this congregation, it's the church. Pastor Carter, this is his field, New York, it's a ministry here. And God says, if you will not yield, if you will not lay down your sin, if you're going to hold to your deceit, I'll give your field to somebody else. And oh, I've seen that over and over. I've seen missionaries come home from the field. I'm dealing with a couple right now. A man overseas fell in love, he said, with somebody overseas. And his wife came home and she's in despair. 
and he's going to fly over and get her and bring her back and marry her, and it's a mess. But I've seen what happens now. That he doesn't have a dollar to his name. His ministry's been taken from him. Nobody on that field wants him. He wants to go back to that field. Nobody wants to touch him. Nobody wants near him. God said, I'll take your field away from you, and I'll give it to somebody else. I'll take away all everything you have. Folks, that's what sin does. Sin will take everything you have. You want a divorce, sir? It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you alimony. It's going to cost you heartache. It's going to cost you probably your car. I had a woman recently tell me that, that her husband had divorced her about 10 years ago. She said, Brother Dave, he divorced me and had every right to because I shamed him. I was not faithful. I, 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 he had every right. I sinned against my husband. And she said, I had a beautiful home, I had beautiful furniture, very expensive, everything. I lived in style. I wound up sleeping in my car. Thank God she got a hold of God and the Lord began to bless her and prosper her. She's serving the Lord now faithfully, being mightily blessed of God. But God took her fields. He'll take your fields. He'll give your best to somebody else. Uh-huh. The wages of sin. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers shall inherit the kingdom of God. Marriage is honorable. The bed is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You say, brother, why are you talking about adultery, fornication? Because the Holy Ghost told me to deal with it. Because God's trying to save some people from hell. God's coming right to your face, face to face. Because you sit here, nobody else knows about it but you and God. Supposedly. If you're in the office, everybody knows it anyhow. They're talking behind your back. Mm hmm. And, and, and God has come face to face with you from a pastor who cares about your soul. And the Holy Ghost says, I'm speaking directly to it now that you've been convicted of it by the power of the Holy Ghost and you lay it down and get your freedom back and get the joy of the Lord back and get the blessing of the Lord flowing and all your rivers flowing once again that have been held up by your sin hallelujah don't anybody look around look in now I'm not suggesting we have many, many into this. If I'm speaking to one or two, it's worth. It's worth every word. It's worth the time to stop and talk it about. I will give your fields to them that shall inherit it. Another present judgment is an invasion of serpents and snakes. Verse 17, Behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices, among you which shall not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. Folks, this is God's word. This is not a pastor getting up, venting his spirit. This is God's word. God said, persist in your sin. I've loved you, I've been patient with you, but he said, there comes a time I'm warning you. Go on with it. And I'll tell you, I, I'm, you're, you're going to split your home. You're going to split everything. You're going to lose everything. I'll give your fields and your career and your business. I'm going to give everything to somebody else. And then I'm going to send serpents to bite you. And you're going to live out your days with poison in you. Bitterness. Rejection. Guilt. Shame. These serpents will bite you. God says... I will send these serpents. Verse 17, behold, read it with me. Verse 17, chapter 8. For behold, I, I, who is it? 
I will send serpents, cockatrices, or those, what, what cockatrices are, are the little snakes that are the most poisonous. Among you which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. Now what happens when you're bitten with the serpent? The poison goes all through your system. And folks, I see Christians everywhere I look now, full of poison, bitter, angry, full of rebellion. Why? Because of sin that is unsurrendered. Unsurrendered, and folks, it produces nothing but the cockatrice bite. Show me a Christian who's living with a hidden secret lust or living a double life. He refuses conviction, refuses the warnings of God's word. That Christian is going to become hard in his sin and his very character is going to change. I see people changing. Folks, probably the saddest thing that can happen in the church of Jesus Christ is that those who should be mothers in Zion, fathers in Zion, those with gray hairs who should be sweet and mellow, be a testimony to a dying world and young people looking for examples of God's grace and mercy to see them become mean and angry and bitter. Nothing, nothing is more vile in my eyes. Nothing bothers me more than to see a grandma in her 70s or 80s sucking a cigar, drinking a cocktail and cursing like a, a drunken sailor. Nothing worse than in the house of God to see grandmothers and women above 50 and 60 years of age in the house of God growing every day and every week meaner and angrier, their face creased with bitterness. And they still come to the house of God, but the serpent has bitten them because sin, unforgiveness, bitterness. And you look at them, so, Lord, their last day spent full of poison. Oh, Lord, I don't want that in my, oh, God, I don't want any poison in me. Hallelujah. I don't want any poison in my system. I want to grow sweeter as the days go by. Hallelujah. what happened to Saul, didn't it? He had bitterness and jealousy and hatred in his heart. An evil spirit from the Lord came upon him. That man died face to face with a witch full of anger, bitterness, and rebellion. And, and, and folks, it's the, the thing that robbed these people was that they knew not the judgment of the Lord. And, with, and I'm going to close with this, but this is so important. Verse 8, please. Verse 8. I'm going to come to the close now. How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Though certainly in vain made he it, the pen of the scribes is in vain. And in the original Hebrew, the pen of the scribes is a lying pen. What the, what the scribes and the priests and the prophets are preaching now, Jeremiah, God is telling Jeremiah, they're not preaching the truth. They're saying, we are wise. Look, it says, we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us. The, the, here, look at this picture, please. Jerusalem is bound by idolatry. The judgment of God is at the door. People know nothing of the judgment of God. And they're in their midst. They are being charmed by a false gospel. And you know, these scribes said, we know the law. They bisected the law. They said, we are wise in the law. We know what the law means. But you know what they did? They perverted the law. They took away the power and the sting of the law. Folks, we are not under the law as a way of salvation, but we are under the law as a moral code. God has not done away with the law. He has honored the law by his absolute perfect righteousness. He has exalted the law as a moral standard. That is our standard. Tell me which one of the Ten Commandments you're not to obey anymore. Give me one. Commandment of God of the Ten that you're not supposed, you and I are not supposed to obey anymore. We are not saved by the law, but it's still our moral code. 
But you see, they've taken away the law. They took away the law and they were saying, peace, peace. We have the law on our side and they were telling people were evil and corrupted that you are a righteous person. You are righteous people. Beloved, let me tell you something. There was a time I was probably one of the hardest preachers in America. I've told Pastor Carter sometimes I listened to my tapes from 20 years ago and I have to shut it off. I, I said, I can't handle that. Because you see, the Lord had to add mercy and grace. And he, he, he seasoned it with mercy and grace. And I've preached a lot of mercy. You've heard Pastor Carter preach great mercy and love. We have preached mercy. We've talked to you about a heavenly father who loves us, who's a nurse to us. We've talked to you about being justified and sanctified by faith. We've talked to you about how, how Jesus Christ is the only righteousness. We have no other plea but his righteousness. Because you see, even when you lay your idols down, even when you can say there's nothing between me and the Lord, it's still not your goodness. It's the mercy and the grace of God and nothing else. But folks, that's one side of this coin. There's another side to the coin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. There, there are so many scriptures here. They said the law of the Lord is with us. And we hear some people preaching what they believe is the truth. But it's all mercy. It's all love. It's all grace. It's all, uh, don't worry. You're okay. Listen to what the word says. Listen closely now. Lay aside the sin that so easily besets you. Lay it aside. Now, folks, that's not the law. That's grace. You've got a sin in your life. Lay it aside. Deal with it. Listen to what the Scripture says. Cleanse yourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And God means that. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's not law. That's not legal. That is mercy. That is grace. He says, but fornication, all uncleanness, all covetousness, let it not once be named among you. And then he says, come out from among them, be you separate and clean, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Then I receive you as my, as a father. You'll be my son. You'll be my daughter. Then I receive you. That's the word too. Now, I tell you always, we close with hope. Now, I want you to go with me, if you will, please, to Psalm 103. Will you stand as we read it? Psalm 103. Did you hear what I said this morning? The judgments of God are not vindictive, they're redemptive. He judges us to save us. Paul said, I turned him over to the devil, to the destruction of the flesh, that his soul might be saved. Judgment to redeem. Hallelujah. Do you have Psalm 103? All right, let's, let's begin reading verse 10 from King James I'm reading. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. He knoweth our frame, he remembers that we are but dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. The wind passeth over it, and it's gone, and the place thereof shall be no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Upon whom? Upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. To who? To such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Folks, what is his commandment? Confess and forsake your sin. Touch not the unclean thing. I say this the last thing I want to say to you this afternoon. I know some of you are battling uh, a horrible battle. You say, Pastor David, I'm convicted. 
I'm deeply convicted. I know what it says here. The mercy of God is upon them that fear him and those who keep his commandments and remember to do them. But I don't have the power. I keep falling. Here, here's the issue. Listen close. Here's the issue. Don't make peace with that sin. Don't say, I'm going to live with it. So, oh God, put it in my heart to hate it. Help me to keep battling. God has never once ever turned away his heart from somebody. No matter how deep in sin they are, no time in history has God ever turned his back or cast away a Christian or a sinner who hates his sin. He has never turned away from those who cry out for deliverance. You may not have it yet, but you're crying out for deliverance. God sees that. He will come. He will bring deliverance. Because that's what your heart yearns and cries for. Don't lose that cry. He's not going to fail you. He's going to deliver you. Now, folks, I've, I've, I've preached along this line this morning, again this afternoon. But God's trying to lead this church into the greatest uh, arena of worship and praise that you and I have ever witnessed. The glory of the Lord wants to come down in this church as he's doing it in many churches today. But he can't do that until we come to him with clean hands and a pure heart and nothing, absolutely nothing hidden in our lives. That you come to church and you raise your hands and you know that you're clean. You know that you have come and laid your sin at the foot of the cross and said, Jesus, here it is. I don't want it. I give it to you. I surrender it to you. Now you give me the grace. You give me the power. You keep, you keep me hating this sin. He's going to rush in. Now I'll tell you, nobody going to have to pump up anything. The choir's not going to have to pump you up. The orchestra, no song leader have to pump you up. Folks, you'll come to this church and you'll be running. I mean, you will come with your hands up and you'll be running in mercy and grace. And there'll be a conviction. There'll be a conviction upon everybody that comes in just because of the awesome presence of the Lord. And you talk about joy. Nobody has joy like people who've been set free. Nobody. You guys from Timothy House and the girls over here from Sarah House and everybody else been delivered from sin and the power of sin. You may be struggling about it, but I'll tell you right now, so oh God, I mean it when I tell you I want to hate this. I don't want to go back. Keep me, Lord, from falling. Present me faultless before your throne with exceeding great joy. And when you follow that and pray every day and get into this word, you won't be standing there anymore. You'll be jumping all over the place with joy and victory like you've never known. Hallelujah. I understand some of you have been doing that up there anyhow. Amen. Yes. Holy Spirit. Mm. Bring the hammer down on us. We thank you, Lord, that that hammer is held by a velvet glove of love. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray for everyone in this building that's been battling a besetting sin that has been holding them back from the fullness of God. It's been such a burden. It's robbed them of such freedom. God, let there be total, final victory in this house today. Nobody needs to know what it is. You just get out of your seat up in the balcony here in the main floor. Hey, there's victory. There's victory today, right now. There's victory within the next 10 minutes. Yes, there is. Get out of your seat. Just get out of your seat. Bring it to God. If you're backslidden, if you don't know Jesus, or if you've got this, this thing that you're battling, bring it to the Lord right now. How to be faithful to God. How to be faithful to God. You know, uh, most of us, I think that'd be the prayer of our heart, isn't it? 
God, I want to be faithful to you no matter what. I want to stand before you one day and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. How to be faithful to God. Reading from Hebrews 4, first uh, three verses. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. And why didn't it profit them? Read it with me. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. All right? I'll read this. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. They entered not in because of unbelief. How to be faithful to God. Heavenly Father, this is such a simple word. And yet, Lord, it's the simplicity of the word that keeps us living strong for you. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your presence tonight. And we thank you, Lord, for people that put your work in your house first. They didn't put television first tonight. They didn't put their family first. They didn't put their, their, their own desires first. They didn't go out to, to eat. They didn't go to the pleasure of this world. They've come here, Lord. And having come here, I pray you spread the table now. Put out the living word on the table. Lord, take my lips and sanctify the word that you put in my heart. Let it come forth freely. And Jesus, feed your people tonight. Encourage those who need to be encouraged. Lord, I thank you for the word. I thank you for the manna, the heavenly manna that you prepare for us every time we come. And Lord, we come hungry to your table right now. Holy Spirit, come and have your way in the preaching and in the hearing of the word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The writer of Hebrews also talked about being partakers of a heavenly calling. I, I don't know if you have tried to figure out what that means, that I'm a partaker of the heavenly calling. To me, it simply means that I hear a call that goes beyond this world. And I'm not called to this world, and this is not my home. I hear a call in my spirit. I, I hear a call. Uh, I had talked on the phone today to a young lady who's not been in this church for a year. She used to sit in the front with crutches. Uh, what's her name? Our Annette Garcia. Do I, does anybody know Annette Garcia in the church? She used to sit right up here in the front with crutches. She has, she has diabetes. And, and uh, <coughs> she, she uh, has had a terrible time with her health. And a number of months ago, uh, she... Uh, she had some kind of a pain in her leg, and they x-rayed and said it was okay. But a few weeks later, it, she had a fever, and she passed out and woke up in the hospital. And uh, she was out of it. They were giving her painkiller. She was in terrible pain in her leg. And they came, and she was half out of it because of, of the painkiller. And they made her sign. She said, they made me sign a paper. Her mother was there, and she thought everything was okay. And she said, this was today. She said, but then when I woke up, I had no right leg. They cut my leg off. And they just they just took it. And I didn't know. I would have never allowed it. I would have really gone home and be with Jesus. They took the leg. And just recently, they wanted to take off the toes and the foot my other leg. And, uh, and she's on dialysis. And... A terrible, terrible physical condition. And uh, I, I'm going to, she's in uh, Yonkers Hospital. I'm, I'm going up there tomorrow morning to visit with her. I prayed with her this afternoon. And uh, she said, Pastor Dave, I've asked them to stop giving me dialysis. She said, they say I'll live maybe five days. And my family's telling me I'm doing the wrong thing. But she says, I don't feel at home here anymore, and I want to go be with Jesus. She said, and I want a body, words to the effect, I want a body with two legs. 
I said, honey, you're going to get your two legs, two arms, two feet, two eyes, two ears. You're going to have a body just like his. And we began to talk, and, and I almost got jealous of her going home in five days. I mean, she is going to, she is going to be out. I told her, I said, honey, you're, going to, you're not going to be here when your family has to face all the things that are coming. God's been merciful to you. She said, I know. She, and and she, she has a heavenly calling now. She's, been, she's called out. Of, this world has no meaning to her. And more and more I'm fighting in my life. That's what I want the Holy Ghost to bring me to, that I live every day as though it were my last day. Because every day could be your last day. You can go into the hospital and just suddenly be gone. I just heard another case. Somebody went in the hospital expecting to have time to get right with the Lord and immediately uh, didn't even come out of the first test, went into a coma, and within a day and a half was gone into eternity. That's why it's important to have this heavenly calling. To, to, to not be a partaker of the things of this world and not to be anchored that the Lord will start cutting all the strings that tie us down to this world. You know, we have Christians tied down to refrigerators and furniture and cars and, and apartments. And, and uh, young ladies are getting married. They say, oh, Jesus, don't come until I get married and enjoy my husband for a year or so. Then you can come. Folks, that may sound a little facetious, but it, that's not the heavenly calling. The heavenly calling is saying there's nothing in this world more important than my, my being in his presence. That's what Paul said. I would rather be with the Lord, but for your sakes I have to stay here. The heavenly calling, simply put, is that you hear heaven calling you. You hear heavenly heaven calling you. Have you ever said, Lord, uh, all I have is yours? You can have it all? How many have said that? Oh, do you mean it? I've said that so many times. But you see, just being loosed from the things of this world, just having all the cords cut, that is not faithfulness in itself. That's not what I mean by being faithful. Some people say, I really could be faithful if I, if I had no materialistic drive at all. There was nothing materialistic in me. I really believe that I could be faithful to God and I would be really pleasing to Him because I, I, I'm just not tied down to the world. Whereas the Bible said, even if you give your body to be burned at the stake and you didn't have love, it would, you, you would be dying and burning up in vain. Your, your martyrdom, your sacrifice of your physical body would have no meaning because you, you were not doing it God's way. You didn't have in your heart the charity and the love to people and to God that made it count. So when I talk about being faithful to the, to the Lord, it, it's not, well, if, if I could just spend more time reading my Bible... If I could have more quality time alone with the Lord, if I could just get over this one besetting sin that still has me in its grip, then I believe I could be called faithful to God and I would at least feel in my heart that God is pleased with me and we try so many, many ways to be faithful to God. We want to hear, you know, we hear about standing before Christ on the judgment seat. We don't want anything against us. We want to be able to say, Lord, uh, I bring to you a sacrifice. My body is a living sacrifice to you. Uh, but you say, wait a minute, Pastor Dave. Do you mean all my striving against sin, all of my sacrificing, and all of my efforts to cut away from materialism and covetousness and all these things, they don't matter? Yes, they do. A faithful person will do all of these things. But that's not faithfulness in itself. That does not describe, that's not the definition of faithfulness to God. There's only one way, according to the scripture, that we can completely be pleasing to God and be faithful to Him. And that's what I want to talk to you about now. Faithfulness is absolutely impossible unless it springs out of a trusting, believing heart. 
You've heard it over and over again. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But you haven't yet looked at that word impossible as you should. It's absolutely impossible. It's all things, all these other things I do because I'm faithful. They won't count unless it comes out of a trusting, believing heart in the Lord himself. You can't be faithful to God if you allow any encroachment of unbelief into your spirit. Any encroachment at all, at any time, allowing yourself, uh, not, I, I don't want to call it a luxury, allowing yourself to fall into a pit of despair and despondency and unbelief. All of this stuff stems from an unbelieving spirit, an unbelieving heart. It all comes out of that because of unbelief. The word preached to them didn't profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it, the Scripture says. And here's where you have to read it. Lord, if it is not co-mixed with faith, every sermon you hear, every Scripture you read is in vain. Because it is, it is a letter that can absolutely kill because you do not have faith behind it. It has no value, the Scripture says. No value whatsoever with without being commingled or mixed with faith. My preaching tonight is not going to mean anything to you unless you mix it with faith. You sit here tonight and say, Lord Jesus, I want to understand and I want to know how to be faithful to you. Teach me tonight. And if you have that spirit of faith right now, God's going to speak, even though I may not be able to express it as good as I feel I should. The Holy Spirit's going to make it known to you. And when you walk out of here tonight, you're going to have settled deep in your heart what it means to be faithful to God. Who was faithful, the scripture says, speaking of Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Jesus was faithful, and Moses was faithful to the Heavenly Father. And how was it that God called them faithful? What were they doing that God says of them, Jesus, my son, is faithful to me. Moses, my servant, is faithful to me. The scripture says they held the beginning of their confidence in God steadfast to the end. They, they, they were able to say, truly, God, my father, is faithful in all things. They believed in the faithfulness of their heavenly father. They trusted completely in his mind and his will. God would make it known to them and they could fulfill it. And just as Jesus was faithful in his confidence with the Father, as Moses was faithful in his confidence with the Lord, this is also the measurement of our faithfulness to God. He measured his own son's faithfulness that way. He measured Moses' faithfulness by his trust in the Father. But Christ as a son over his own house whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. If. We, we are his house, we are his body, if we hold fast our confidence in him to the very end. And we don't falter, we don't give up on our faith. You know, uh, there's a tendency in all of us when trials begin to pile up, and prayers appear not to be answered. And difficulties come from all sides. You've heard me say many times in this pulpit, when problems and troubles and trials come, they come in pairs. And they come in quadruple. And sometimes they come just from every side. Trouble never comes once at a, one at a time. It doesn't come facing you. It comes this way, behind you, above you, around you. That's why the Bible says you're in the water, you're swimming for your life. There's a, there's a tendency when we get to that place to abandon our confidence in God. There's a tendency, we don't want to accuse God of not loving us. So what we do, and really it's a slap in God's face, we say, well, I guess... There's something wrong with me, or I don't have it all figured out. Or there's something wrong with my faith. I haven't figured faith out. But the bottom 
of all of that is a lack of confidence in God's faithfulness. It's a lack of confidence and nothing else. Now, the way the devil comes at us <clears throat> is through lies. Lies. You know the devil is a what? And he's the father of all lies. So every lie you hear is from the devil. Every lie you hear comes directly out of the pits of hell. The devil, the Bible said, was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. John eight forty four. You've heard of, of the mother of all wars? Well, this is the mother of all lies, or the father of all lies, the Scripture says. God clearly warns his church that in the last days, the serpent is going to spend all his time accusing his brethren, the brethren, that's Christ's children, with a lying spirit. He's going to come against you with a barrage of lies. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The Bible said the devil cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. That's the church. That he might carry her away with the flood. And beloved, listen to me please. The devil is trying to sweep you absolutely away. To, to rob you of your faith and confidence in God. And he will come at you with a barrage of lies. Right out of the pit of hell. You can be worshiping the Lord in church and he'll try to attack you right in the house of God. He'll attack you on the street. He'll attack you when you lay down at night. You won't be able to sleep some nights because he will harass you. He injects into your very mind his lies. He speaks. He's a liar. The Bible says that he's going to come with a flood of lies. If you believe the word of God, believe this. I read it to you again. He will cast out of his mouth water like a flood after the woman or after the church that he might cause her, God's people, to be carried away with the flood. The flood of discouragement, the flood of fear that he causes by these manifold lies. <clears throat> this flood of lies has come, it comes mostly to disrupt your peace. See, God always ministers peace. The devil comes to minister fear. Fear is not of God, never was and never will be. The Bible says he's not given us a spirit of fear, but love and power and a sound mind. Now, who, who does he lie to? He doesn't lie to his children out in the street. He, he, he's already got them deceived. They have no faith. He's not after their faith because they have none. So who does the devil lie to? The Bible says after the woman, after the church, he goes after God's chosen people. And the more you want God, the hungry you are for the Lord Jesus, the more you, willing you are to lay aside the whole world, you become a target. You are the hot spot in his target. What do they call that dart in the middle of the target? Bullseye. You're the bullseye. Got it. Let, let me tell you that he is subtle and he's very convincing. And when, when you begin to pursue God's rest, the rest that I read to about here, where you say, Lord, I don't want to fear man. I don't want to fear in my life anymore. I want to live with peace in my heart. I want the joy of the Lord to be flooding in my soul. I don't want to have to be resting in my own works anymore to try to please God because I've tried so hard. I've tried to please God and I, I feel so many times that I failed Him. I feel so condemned sometimes and I feel so down. Well, folks, why are you feeling so condemned and down and fearful? Because you have already been listening to some of His lies. The lies of the enemy have already made an inroad, even though you're not aware of it. Somewhere subconsciously, these lies have been implanted 
in your spiritual mind. Hebrews 4 again. You still have Hebrews open? Go to verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that's entered into his rest, he is also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Look at me, please. Listen. I, I believe uh, Times Square Church people come here. I believe the devil has his demonic monitors center outside the door of this church. And I, I believe that the, all the all the principalities and powers of darkness, they are aware of your progress in God. They're aware of your hunger for God. Because you are moving further and further away from the kingdom of darkness. You've been translated into the kingdom of light, and you're preferring light now instead of the darkness. Even the battles you have, you're saying, I hate my sin, and the devil despises that, that you are learning to hate your sin. He sees your cry to be sanctified. He sees husbands starting to love their wives and be tender toward them. He sees wives beginning to submit to their husbands. And he sees things beginning to line up in your life according to the Scripture. And he sees you at home, not parked for hours in front of a television set, but you have your Bible out and you, you enrage the devil when you're sitting there not drinking in some incredible foolishness. But here you are with your Bible open. And I will tell you, he will come to you when your Bible is open. When you are sitting there uh, reading your Bible and praying, you're going to tell me he, he, he's not going to try to attack you and lie to you? Because he knows he has lost you. And he doesn't want to give up that easy. He will come. What does the Bible say? He comes as a roaring lion to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. Doesn't say it's possible. It, it's possible if you just, if you will uh, believe these lies and give in to them. But that's why God sent the Holy Ghost. You see, the rest we're talking about, that's simply just a trust in God. It, it's no deep theological problem to figure out what rest is. It's saying, Lord, you've got everything under control. I really don't have anything to worry about. Lord, you promised that I'm not going to have to beg for bread. You said you're my heavenly father. You said you've numbered every hair in my head. You said you'll make a way where there is no way. You told me to go into the Word and look at the Old Testament, how you took care of three million Jews in the wilderness where there was there were no stores or no food stamps. There were nothing. And you took care of them. Lord, you told me that that's my example to believe, that, that you gave me examples all through it. Isn't that true? So, let me, let me talk to you about some of these lies that, that he brings into our life. His biggest lie of all is this. You ready? You are making no spiritual progress at all. You haven't learned anything. You're just as bad as you used to be. Anybody heard that one? He'll come to you and say, in spite of all your hunger for God and all of your self-denial, in spite of all of the ministry you've heard and all the sermons you've heard, you're making no progress in your Christian walk. You're still just as sinful. You've got a wooden head. You're still full of self. You've been given so much and you've heard so much. It's not changed you. You're not growing up spiritually. You'll never grow up if you live to be a hundred years old, he says. Mm -hmm. That's one of his biggest lies, and, it, and, and it comes to many of us. He'll say something's wrong with you. You're not getting it. Everybody around you is growing. They're all passing you by. 
Just look around. Everybody's happy but you. Everybody's getting their bills paid but you. Everybody's getting their prayers answered but you. You're sick and everybody else is healthy. What's wrong with you? He'll say, you're a phony. You're a hypocrite. You're weak. You're spineless. You're no good. Every one of those are lies. God doesn't talk to his children like that. The Holy Ghost doesn't talk like that. Another big lie. You are too weak for spiritual warfare. You're too weak. This spiritual warfare is too much for you. You are worn out. You are strung out. And you know what you do? You whisper, you are tired. You're weak. You're sick. You're dying. Lord, been, the devil's been trying to tell me that the last two years I'm dying. How many times the devil telling you you're dying? Every pain you get? Cancer. Cancer. I got cancer. I know it. It's cancer. Pain in your arm? A heart attack. I'm, I, I need a doctor and it's a heart attack. My arm fell asleep recently. It was tingling. It was from falling asleep. And I'm saying, uh-oh. And I honestly, I had three locks. And I went and unlocked the door so if I died, somebody wouldn't have to break the door down to find my body. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me? You do the same thing. How many times he whispered to you, you're tired, you're worn out, this battle's too much for you? Why go on in spiritual warfare? Because you're not winning anything anyhow. Come on now. These are lies of the devil. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. How does he wear you out? By lying insinuations. There are times that I've come in here, and if I had given in to those lies, I would have crawled to this pulpit feeling so tired. Much of our spiritual weariness is caused by this implanted lie, a constant stream of lies saying, you're wearing down, something's wrong, you're supposed to be at rest. And then the devil says, there's sin behind it. You say, Pastor Dave, you mean as pastor of this church, as one of the pastors of this church, the devil does that? He puts those kind of lies in your heart? Oh, yes. You think I'm Superman? My goodness, no pastor's Superman. They're <laughs> flies and blood just like everybody else. Amen, Sam? Amen. See, question, Satan will question your faith. That's all it's about. He questions your faith. He keeps questioning your faith. When you get sick, he'll just question you. Why are you sick? Where's the sin? Where's your faith? He'll question you every step of the way. Here's another vicious lie, terrible lie. God's not with you. You've grieved him away. God's not with you anymore. You've grieved him away. Oh, he still loves you, but he's not with you. There's something in you, unseen, unknown. His blessing is not on you right now. And you know what he'll do? The devil will take the scripture itself out of context and pound you with it. Try to pound your faith into the ground. He'll say, didn't God leave Israel when they sinned? Your present dry spell and your present struggle and your trials, all your troubles, isn't that proof that God's not with you? You're on your own. The Holy Ghost has left you. That has happened to so very, very many people. This was the lie that was planted by the devil in Gideon's mind. You know, Israel had been delivered out of the hands of the Midianites. 
and they were suffering cruelly at their hands, and God said to Gideon, The Lord's with you, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. And a lie came into his mind, and he looked around at his circumstances. You know what he told God? He said, If the Lord is with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers talk about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and has delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now, God did that simply to chase them, but God had come forward now saying, I want you to stand up in faith because I'm going to deliver you. I want to deliver you. I'm sure the devil tried to sell Moses on the lie that God was going to forsake Israel. Time and time again, the devil attacked Moses. But God said Moses was faithful in all of his house. He never mistrusted me. No matter how black it seemed, no matter how dark and how hopeless it seemed, Moses held on to his confidence in me, the Lord says. Here's what happened. This, this is why Moses never doubted the Lord. He knew his merciful heart. He knew that God loved his children, that he would never forsake them. Listen, I want to share this with you before I close. It's so important for you to understand this. The thing that has blessed me and helped me more than anything in my life, and I go through some very difficult times too, I get my faith tested time and time again. But the one thing that keeps bringing me back is I am so convinced that God loves his people. God loves his children. He is passionately in love with his children and he cares. And then I, the, God, the Lord always says, look at yourself, David. Look at yourself. I just got a beautiful letter from one of my sons today. It just made me rejoice and weep inside. He just said, Dad, I'm so glad. I took him up on a mountain one time when he was seven years old. And I told him what God was going to do with him. The Lord had given me a vision. And I, I prophesied over all my children. And he said, Thanks, Dad, for that mountaintop on your knee. And thank you for loving me enough to trust me into the hands of Jesus. And if I can have that kind of relationship with my sons, my children. My daughter, Bonnie, called me today. She was uh, trying to pull out of a, a supermarket. <coughs> She's parked between two cars and a pickup truck blocked her. And there was nobody around anywhere. This pickup just blocked her, couldn't get out. And this man was intent on evil. She just rolled up the window and bowed her head and began to cry out to God, mercy. And out of nowhere, God sent a car. And they sped off. And she talked to her today. She was just tre uh, trembling. And I felt the Father's heart. And I prayed, God, I prayed with her. I said, an angel of the Lord is with you, honey. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And here I am as an earthly father, feeling for her pain and her, even her fears and everything else. And he said, if you've been earthly, know how to do that. How much more your heavenly father? How much more? I always think of my love. Maybe some of you have not had a loving father and you can't relate to that. But he's an absolute loving father. And if you can trust his love, you can trust him in everything. You can, you can be faithful in your confidence in him because you know he's not mad at you. He may chasten you for a season, but he does that only because he said he loves you. And you say, well, I'm struggling with so much sin. I'm struggling with so many things. And you go through all these lies. God knows the devil's lying to you. And all he's saying, stand still now. Just stand still and see my salvation. Don't fret about it. Don't listen to it. I don't care what your experience. I don't care what you're going through. He is here to embrace you tonight 
And, and the Lord made it clear when I, I came to the pulpit tonight, even on the way here, he said, I, I, there are so many of my children, David, there are so many here tonight, just need the embrace of the Heavenly Father. They need to know that they're loved. And that's, I'm his shepherd, and he, he's told me to tell you that, that he cares about what you're going through. He sees every tear that you've shed. He knows what you're feeling right now and about all your family problems. That this precious little Annette that's at the hospital room right now uh, and, and beginning to go into death throes uh, because of the choice that she's made. Don't you know that Jesus is there as her nurse? He's nursing her. He's nursing you right now. He wants to nurse you right through it. You know, uh, it, it's a nurse who cares, not one of those uh, hard nurses. This is what jabs a needle. No, this is the one that tries to bathe away all the pain and the hurt. Are you going to trust him through what you're going through right now? Will you trust him and not accuse him of abandoning you, not accuse him of uh, not answering your prayers, not accuse him of anything, but just say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to trust you through this. I'm going to trust you through my battle. I'm going to trust you through my pain. I'm going to trust you through all my sicknesses and whatever may come upon me. I'm going to trust you. Hallelujah. Otherwise, folks, you get a hard heart. Every bit of unbelief leads, leads to a hard heart, and that's not God's plan. Will you stand? Hallelujah. Folks, this is such a simple word tonight. Very, very simple. Do you believe you're loved? I mean truly, wonderfully, marvelously loved by the Heavenly Father. And by Jesus, the Son of the living God, and by the Holy Ghost who abides in you. Is not your body the temple of the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. You know so? I've tried to preach you through the Holy Ghost into encouragement. And I see some of you tonight look so down. So downcast. Looks like you've got a 300 pound weight on your shoulder. I'm not going to look at you unless you think I'm picking you out. But I'll put my head down. But I know I have the mind of the Holy Spirit tonight. The devil has half the battle, half his battle against you won. If he can just get you to doubt the love of God for you and God's concern for you and care for you. And if he can convince you that God's mad at you, angry at you, then he's halfway won his battle. So, by an act of faith right now in this service, not some big emotional upheaval in your heart, but through a simple act of faith, say, Jesus, I accept your love. I know you care for me. And God, thank you for not being mad at me. Thank you for not being angry at me. Thank you for loving me. And then say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you to sanctify me. I'm going to trust. You know that's the work of the Holy Ghost. It's not your work. You can't cleanse yourself. You can't sanctify yourself. You can't purify yourself. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. If we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, then you shall live. Through the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, thank you for coming and living in me. Jesus came to die for me to provide salvation. The Holy Ghost was sent to see that it happens. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Father, forgive our unbelief. Take it away. Lord, you're not even rebuking us. You're, you're telling us in love that that unbelief will harden our hearts. Unbelief will cause us to bear so many burdens that we don't have to bear. And we go through so much turmoil that's unnecessary. Oh God, by your Spirit, lift this fear. I come against anxiety. I come against unbelief. And Lord, fear, despair, 
and all of these things that are pushed on us by the lies out of hell, we take your authority over them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you have, I have a special altar call tonight only for those who've been oppressed of the enemy. You've been oppressed by the devil. You have been a victim. You've been victimized by these lies of the enemy. And it's brought discouragement and it's brought some fear to your heart. Whatever it may be, you say, Brother Dave, that was for me because tonight I have to tell you the devil has been lying to me, trying to get me down and trying to rob me of, and shake my faith. Just, if he can just rattle your faith and shake it. That's what he tries to do. Come. Remember when those two disciples going to Emmaus, uh, Jesus came on them. They must have been so downcast. They must have been, they, they must have looked like they were dying or something. And Jesus says, why are you troubled? Why are you troubled? You know, I think that's why I'd, I'd, I'd want to say to so many of you up here, why are you so troubled? Why are you troubled? And and you would tell me, and you'd list all the reasons or something that's very, very strong and something very powerful that's happening in your life, something very shaking maybe, and you would tell me all that. But then I'd have to come back to you and say, no matter what it is, no matter what, if you were looking death right in the face like Annette is, God is going to be faithful. God's Word is true. Hallelujah. God's Word is true. He's still not going to change His love for you. So why not believe Him right now with everything that's in you? Come like a child to, his, to the foot of the throne and say, Jesus, tonight, I don't want unbelief to take a hold in me and grip me because unbelief leads to hardness of heart. Did you hear me? Look at me. It's that serious. Unbelief will cause you to harden your heart against God. Why, God? I don't understand, God. And it's going to harden you. I know you don't want your heart hardened. You want your heart soft before the Lord. So ask God to forgive you of any kind of thought like that. And say, Jesus, whatever it is, I'm going to commit it to you right now. I resign from trying to figure it out. I resign and give it in your hands. Close your eyes right now. If you want to lift your hands to the Lord, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I ask you to forgive my unbelief, all my doubting, all my questions. I'm sorry. Oh, Jesus, I know you love me. I know you see my faults. You see my failings, but I know you still love me. Forgive me, Jesus, and send the Holy Ghost to give me power to live for you, Jesus. Cleanse me of all sin and mostly of unbelief. I keep, I lay it at your feet. Jesus, help me to trust you in what I'm enduring, what I'm going through. I commit to you now, into your hands, to do what is right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful Savior. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray that you just sweep down upon us right now this Friday night right in the heart of New York City and Times Square and bring a spirit of encouragement now. Lift up the spirits that are fallen down. Lift them up, Lord, every heart. I want you to just raise your hands and begin to love the Lord right now. Just raise your hands. Begin to worship Him. Say, Lord, you're faithful. Lord, you're true. Say it to Him. Tell Him how faithful He is. Testify to it right now. Lord, you are faithful. You're not going to fail me, God. I'm not going to go around doubting you anymore. I'm not going to mistrust you. Lord, I put my confidence in you. Forgive my unbelief, O oh God. I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful to you, Lord, in my confidence, holding fast my confidence to the end. Lord, you've not failed.